Good evening. Welcome back once again to the political show. I'm your host, Leonard Gildari. This evening, we are fortunate and it's a pleasure for us uh, to have once again in my company, Gail Tashira, and she's no stranger to the Guyanese politics. Although she has not been here in the studio, we have met many times in the corridors of the parliament buildings uh, when she would have had her press conferences and you would know her. Uh, she is no stranger to the Guyanese and you would know that she is, was started off as a personal secretary to Dr. Chedi Jagan long time back, 40 years. Uh, she has spent over 43 years and told in politics, not insignificant. I think that's a few years shy of my um, birth anniversary. So I could say you have a lot more experience than me there. You've risen to become the Minister of Home Affairs. You were also a Minister of Foreign Affairs. And eventually, until December the 21st, 21st sorry, last year, and until your resignation, uh, you are the opposition parliamentary chief whip. Yes. Madam Tashira, welcome and season's good terms. Well, thank you very much. Mm. Good night to all your viewers and listeners. Um, it's a pleasure to be on your program. I uh, you must say that uh, uh, you look a lot Christmassy this evening. Mm, I thought months. you may have told me I was looking through PPP, but it's all right. No, no, I, I think, <laughs> I think same, being, same difference, actually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> politically correct and say that you're Christmassy here. Yes. So, as a woman, as a confidant of Dr. Jagan, how hard has it been for you to rise to where you are today? I think any woman um, in politics, particularly in the generation I came up, would have many challenges. Um, but when I look back on it, it was the best ride, I think, if that, I, that life gave me. There's no other thing I would have thought I would have used my life for. And so if, you know, if I had to choose this again, it would be all over again this. This choice of being in the People's Progressive Party, choosing to politics as a career, um, and, and getting to know Guyana and getting to know our people and going to the villages and going in the savannas and going down the rivers. This is an experience that is, was gifted to me by politics. I mean, I could have chosen to be a politician, sit in an armchair and philosophize, but that's not my style. And so the PVP gave me that opportunity as a young woman coming in the party um, to, to go to different parts of the country and never said, um, oh, as a woman, women don't go there, a woman shouldn't do that. And so, um, and I was kind of adventurous, so that I would say, why can't I go here? And, and Mrs. Jagan would always be the one supporting. So, um, these opportunities I, w I was given um, really uh, allowed me to appreciate and to have a lot of faith in our people and a, and a vision for our country, which the PVP has had in those days and which the PVP has, has been uh, molding and creating over the years in government and, of course, when we return to government in, on March 2nd. A personal secretary to Dr. Jagan, who was a founder of the PBB, yes. People's Progressive Party. And then you became a minister. As a matter of yes. fact, several portfolios, Minister of Home Affairs, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think in whatever order, but those are not insignificant uh, portfolios no. to have held. How was that? How did that work? Well, you? I, th I think you, because you're stressing on that, and that is that I came back to Guyana after having finished university and everything else. I was born here, grew up here. My parents emigrated, and then I returned to Guyana. And um, I met Chedi in 1976. I was part of a organizing of a program for him, and he said to me, well, what do you want to do? Are you going to stay? And I said, no, I don't want to stay in Canada. I'm a misfit. I want to go home. And uh, he said, really? And so on my birthday, I received a letter from him inviting me to come home to be his personal assistant. And that was one of the greatest honors, I think, that have been, I've been given. And so I came home to work as his personal assistant. Of course, um, from there, I got into the leadership of the party. I, I um, traveled around the country. I did my political work. And then when we got into government, which was quite a number of years later, 
um, I became Minister of Health and then subsequently Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport and then Minister of Home Affairs and in between acted as Minister of Foreign Affairs on a number of occasions. So that um, I guess someone might say that I earned my stripes and that I served my country and my party faithfully and loyally. Some people say that you're the natural successor to Dr. Roger Lunchin. Uh, an experienced man, uh, 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 somebody would say, why are you in his own rights? Would you say that you're a natural successor to him? No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Luncheon is a very unique and special individual. I'm not in that uh, category. Talk his duties. Yeah, no, no, no. He's also special in the, in the, in the way he handles his duties. Roger Luncheon, uh, as a member of our cabinet and Secretary of Defense Board and Secretary of the Cabinet, was an institution. And it was quite um, you know, intimidating sometimes to watch him in operation. Um, no, I don't think I have those qualities. <laughs> and actually, I'm not, he's very strong. He was very strong in administration. That's not necessarily, at this stage of my life, I want to do much administration. In October, uh, Madam Tishir, you would have confirmed your relinquishment of your Canadian citizenship. Yeah. And this was as a result of that court ruling as yes. a result of December the 21st, yeah. uh, the No Confidence Rule. Yes. Uh, you're not known as a businesswoman, and I think a decision to give up uh, the Canadian citizenship, which has its benefits, health benefits, and so on. How easy is that for you, or was that for you financially or otherwise? Well, there was no financial issue to it because I never benefited. Um, when I returned to Ghana 43 years ago, I, I had been a student in Canada and so on, so I hadn't benefited um, working in Canada and accumulating and, and I'm not entitled to health benefits unless I go to live there. I'm not entitled to any of the benefits unless I live there. So no, there were, there were no benefits that I was receiving or could receive. For me, the, the, uh, when I processed the papers in April, um, this year, and my renunciation came through on June the 26th, um, it was more an emotional thing because I still have my father there, he's 94 years old, and therefore it was easy with a Canadian passport to jump on a plane and go visit him. Now I have to go through a visa <laughs> process. Have you um, given you your visa? Not yet, I haven't got it yet. <laughs> I haven't applied for it, to tell you the truth. That was the other easy thing with a passport. I didn't have to go and pay the visa fees every time I wanted to travel. No, it, it was more it was more like an emotional, psychological thing of closing that door of my life. And, and that, that part of my life as a young girl, as a young, a young woman, uh, before I came home, was that Canada had given me a lot of opportunities to do, go to university and get my bachelor's and my master's, which if my parents had remained in Ghana, we could not have afforded that. And so it's that kind of little, uh, the little emotional twing that you feel. But um, no, I don't regret it because I never had dual loyalty in the first place. I had dual citizenship and not dual loyalty. A distinction, isn't it? For me, it's a distinction, yes. Early this year, there was uh, the, the issue came up with a choice for a presidential candidate. Yes for the People's uh, Progressive Party. Uh, your name was among one of them. Yes. And then somewhere along the way you said it, you know, you're not interested. What's the story there? I am, I have always been a, a disciplined member of my party. And my interest is always what's best for the party, what's best for the country. And so um, I went up in 2011 as well. And um, I declined just a moment before the vote, so that three of us declined, so there would be no vote. There would be an acclamation of uh, Donald Ramatar. In this case, there was a vote, um, and I declined um, because I didn't feel that it was right to split the, the votes in such a way that we may not come out with a candidate. And so that that is the only story behind it my position is that once the central committee decided on my comrade Irfan Ali a young comrade that my duty and my responsibility is to give him all the support I can and to give him all my energies and knowledge that I have and experience 
to make sure that he and the PPP are successful. I am not an egotistical person, so I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not into what you call bigging up yourself. I was there to serve, and, and I am still there to serve. Would you not say it's, a, it's an indication also that you believe that you have the capacity, that you're capable of leading this country in the highest position? One always thinks that one, I mean, many people, I'm looking at the new parties being formed and everybody thinks it can be president and I smile to myself because having worked with Chedi and uh, Sam Hines as Janet Jagan, Jack Dale and Ramatar as president, um, it's an awesome responsibility and it's no, what do you call, walk in the park. Yeah. And it's 24-7 bombardment and... Uh, and, and so it's, it's, an, it's a really onerous responsibility and an enormous one. And I think some people take it too casually. For me to even make a decision to put my name up was to go through all the, the what I had experienced to say, you know, do I really have it? Could I really do it? And in the end, for me, the decision that was taken by the party of Air Finale, I think, is the best position. Because after all, I'm not a, a young girl anymore. You know, the, in, in the party now, in this period, in this period we're in now, this generation uh, globally, not just in Guyana, that the, the, there'd be great opportunities for younger women to get into high positions, such as presidents and prime ministers. In my day, it was probably a little more competition, fewer women and more men. Now I think they're, they're, women are coming on their own, and I think that will come in its own time. Well, as we talk here, I was looking at the news not too long ago. Something happened in Finland. Yeah. So women, uh, uh, some women who were leading that country. Yes, yes. Under 35. Yep. Amazing. And you look at New Zealand, a young woman as well. You've had a number of the Asian countries that have had, that are traditional, that have had women as prime ministers. India and, um, what was it, Bangladesh and so on. These are traditional, more traditional countries. So that... It's about time that women in Europe start to take their rightful place. Because they've kind of been so. lagging, they've so. been yeah, lagging behind. So. No, 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 I hope to live and see um, at some point a woman take become president of our country. Well, let's see how that goes. I, mean, I think we're changing and for the better. Uh, I want to ask you, you mentioned Dr. Jagan, and I, w uh, I would, there are some people who believed, and you would, I'm not sure if I would be, Correct and classify you as part of the old guard. But <laughs> <laughs> I would want to say, do you believe, would you say that the PPP has strayed from his ideals or, or the ideals that Dr. Jagan would have uh, no. established? I think a lot of this trying to divide the PPP on terms that many people don't even comprehend um, is wickedness in the sense that what did Chedi stand for? Chedi stood all his life for the betterment of the people, <coughs> for equality, for improvement in the conditions of people, and for a philosophy in which he talked about inclusivity of, certainly he promoted the working class as a group, but by the, by the time he came into government, the whole position of the PPP was talking about multi-sectoral economies, uh, inclusivity, involvement of civil society, and so on. We have not strayed from any of that. The PPP has not strayed from any of that. In fact, in government, under Cherry, and subsequently we remain loyal to that in a variety of ways. The whole issue of the constitutional reforms that came in that try to have a form of inclusivity, of power sharing in a sense, if you want to call it that, where the, the leading opposition was given a veto vote on the president in the constitu certain constitutional appointments. Of course, that has evaporated under this president. But those were some of the thoughts and, and views of Chedi of how to, to create unity, not only in terms of just rhetoric, but structurally, organically, through the Constitution, through laws and stuff like that. And so, same thing with the economy. Jenny talked about a multi-sector economy. He didn't talk about, you know, workers' proletariat and state-owned companies and things. He did not. He talked about the role of the state sector, the um, business sector, 
the workers, and of course, he did have a liking for cooperatives, but they never really got off the ground in Ghana, and there have been many, many, att many attempts for, what, 40 years or 50 or more, so that I do not believe that we've strayed against his views, and, and having sat um, at the Central Committee of the party from 1980, I've been a member of the Central Committee, that the PPP hasn't strayed. What may have changed from time to time is our methodology, how we organize ourselves. We're in a, an age of technology. In the old days, you didn't have that technology. You had to send a letter, it took six weeks to the Northwest. Uh, you know, you, you went out for a month and did work in an in a, in a area because there was no way to get back and to finish all you had to do. Technology has helped us to improve the way we do our work. But the PPP is still loyal to the views of uh, a Guyana which is modern. And I remember this discussion in the cabinet when Chetty was president. He talked about, what's our vision for Guyana? What do we want Guyana to be in five, ten years' time? And we went around the room and everybody contributed their views. And it came out to this, a modern, democratic nation that included all peoples, that reduced poverty, that gave opportunities for people to uh, educate and to be trained and have businesses and to be able to, to uh, contribute to the society in, in a serious manner. And what was the role of government in that? And that's to facilitate people being able to access loans or access training or access opportunities or access land to be able to, to, to grow. Uh, and so these, these were not... The, these views that came about were not um, changes in terms of a radical break with what Chetty may have thought of in the 19, you know, 50s. It was actually an evolution and a, and a, um, a continuation of his thoughts and, and the thoughts of the PPP. So the, the view that we have betrayed um, Chetty, no, we have not. We have continued when we're in government at the international level to take progressive positions, as Guyana did even under Burnham, to do with Palestine, to do with anti-apartheid. We're the ones who, um, in the Caribbean, led the way in the Caribbean about uh, opposing the unilateral invasion of Iraq, for example. We have always taken progressive positions. So that didn't change. We haven't changed any of that. What we're in a real world today in that the the powers that be, um, one has to, as Jenny said then, and I still believe in now, that we have to walk between the raindrops sometimes. I, I mean, I remember when we got into government, the whole issue was that in 92, with um, uh, Cambio mm -hmm. and... Um, oh my. Oh my. Yeah. Oh my. Um, was, you know, young Turks amongst them were saying, we got to, you know, get rid of the, the, the contract, we got to... And we went and got legal advice and international advice. And the view was, no, don't go in that direction. And so you did have some on, on the edge that said, no, we, you know, we should have done something else. But Chetty was also one that said, you know, you, you, we had to work in a real world. And Guyana had to survive in this real world. And how do we negotiate? How are we able to, 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 to do what we have to do to, for the best of our country? So we remained patriotic. We remained very patriotic and putting Guyana's interests first and, and also having um, a, a social consciousness in relation to international issues. But we're not, uh, as some people try to paint us, as this communist boogie that, you know, <laughs> we're somehow a, a creature of Russia or Cuba, which PPP never was, even in the early days. So I think this, this whole view that's being portrayed is, is really mischief and being led by people who either are totally unaware of what the PP stands for or is trying to create a myth about what we stood for. You know, the party started in 1950, but by 1980-90 it has gone through its transformations and it has continued to go through its transformations. January coming we will be, uh, what is it, 70 years old. We're the oldest party in the English-speaking Caribbean, I believe. And certainly we could not be living in some dogmatic um, cocoon of 1950. We've had to evolve, but we've kept the principles and values the same. And that's what's important. That's what defines us as a party.
how do we reconcile that to the fact that we, I don't think it was early this week that we saw son of them, Dr. Jagan, Joey Jagan, join in endorsing the coalition governments? <laughs> Joey um, was never a member of the PPP, first of all. He was the son of Chetty Jagan. So he doesn't have the experience of sitting in a lot of the decision-making levels of the PPP. And Joey has always been controversial and problematical, even when his parents were alive. Um, I give no credence to what he does or says, because I think that somewhere in his brain that um, he really never understood what we stand, what we stood for, what we've done. I don't think so. So I'm not going to waste any breath on on Joey. Joey will be Joey until one of us goes, but it's not going to change him. It's not going to change me. It's not going to change the PPP. And the people out there who listen to him and listen to us, Joey has lost his credibility amongst the base of the PPP, his father's base. They have no respect for him. They don't take him seriously because in a way, by what he's doing, he attacks the party of his father. You know, so he thinks he's attacking individuals, but he's attacking the party that his father gave life to and which continues in his name. I want to step it up a little here. On December yes. the 24th, 2018, yes. something happened. There was shock across the country and the chambers of the National Assembly, and uh, there was shock among the government, uh, on the faces of the government officials. Were you shocked at that decision by China to back your party in the vote? Delighted. It was absolutely delightful. Um, I Were you surprised? Uh, yes, I was, because I wasn't sure who or who or if any of them would have the courage to stand and support the no-confidence motion. Um, absolutely delighted, because by then, I mean, you had the local government elections, and I, I just wanted to go over this. 2015, the government, when I listened to Mr. Granger's interviews, recent interviews of December 1st and 5th, I think one was on your program, um, he seems to have forgotten that this, the number of votes he got was 4,526, less than 1% difference between the PVP and the APNU AFC, after all the shenanigans and all what we call tampering with the elections, which of course you know the election petition has been heard up to now, after five years. The only country in the entire world where there's been an election petition has been heard as yet. <laughs> but he went to the 2016 local government elections. He lost by 30,000 votes. He went to the 2018 local government elections and lost by 47,000 votes, having increased the number of local authorities. Uh, AFC, who decided to go alone, lost by 113,000 votes to us. One of the pillars on which a government sits is the electorate. Eighty percent of those who vote in local government elections are the voters of Guyana. So 80 percent of the people voted against APNO. Then you have the parliament, which is the second pillar on which any government's legitimacy rests. And the parliament rejected that. So, at that point, the government was defeated, totally defeated and needed to call elections within three months. So that it was, I think, the government went in, and you were there, I think, when they said, uh, Amna Ali said, bring it on, bring it on, and Moses said that none of this would happen, we were wasting the time of the parliament. They refused to let us have the, the motion early and then put it just before Christmas, December 21st, and then call us Grinch. Remember? We were the Grinch of Christmas 2018. But the point was that Mr. Charandas, who I am not personal friends with, I don't know him very well, but the point is that he was living in Fort Kanji, uh, in the area of the estates where thousands of people lost their jobs. And he saw for himself. So for the record's sake, uh, Madam Tashira, you had, uh, as chief whip of the PVP, you had no idea that China's facade would have voted that way? No, no, I, I don't. 
I know that we were hoping that some would, but I don't have an, any idea up, up until that point of who it would be. Uh, I want to backtrack a little before we come to what transpired this year. Uh, you are, uh, one would say, a very powerful woman and a decision maker in your party. What went wrong in the 2011 uh, period leading up to 2011, then the 2015? In 2011, you lost majority in parliament, and in the 2015, uh, uh, there's a new government. Hmm. What went wrong? I think there are a number of things that, that we have gone through our own catharsis in 2011 to look at it and, and then subsequently 2015. A number of things do happen to parties when they've been in government for a long time. So that is a, a, a research fact that when a, a party has been in power and won election after election, we were in, in government for 23 years. That after a while, particularly when this new combination came up of APNU, AFC in 2015, well 2011 and then 2015, that this looked as if it was something different and new, and people may want to try it. Now, <clears throat> despite all of that, though, <clears throat> despite all of that, the twenty, the, in fact, the 2011, the 30,000 votes that APNU plus AFC got, they went as two separate parties, so that the PVP legitimately was the party without the largest blocker votes. So. Even though together they had 30,000 seats more, votes more than us, and therefore one more seat in parliament, in terms of our legitimacy and our ability to run government, we were still the party with the largest block of votes. So that is an important issue. The second one was that 2015, when you're talking about over a billion dollars probably going into PR by APNU and AFC, um, that people were told and fed a lot of information as, and I believe Kaiji News helped in that way too, the corruption that we were corrupt, the uh, number of persons who were killed in the 2002-2008 um, period, and that became the mantra from 2008-2009 right through to 2015 and up to now, because I, again in the interview with Mr. Granger, he talks about evidence in relation to the challenges of corruption, accusations of corruption they made on us, and also the, they talked about the troubles, what he calls the troubles, where people were killed, and, and they talk about the 400 Afro-Guyanese who were killed. And now they talk about evidence. But when they went out on the political campaign, and when the media, certain houses, went out on the campaign, day after day, day after day, year after year, putting into people's heads that this was this corrupt bunch of people out there doing all sorts of things. Certainly they must have some evidence to be doing that. There had to be information. You, it, could, it would be highly irresponsible to go out and make accusations with, without anything to back it. And what is now coming out um, is that all of this was hot air. This was all a means to, to denigrate the PPP's image, to get rid of the PPP in government. And despite all of that, all those, all of that that took place, what happened in 2015? No matter what the PNC up no AFC says, they cannot live down, and they will never be able to live down, that their attempt to have an alliance to get into government was by a hair breath of 4,526 votes. And had there been a recount, and in countries across the world, democratic countries, you should have an account, a recount if it's less than 5%. In our case, it was less than 1%. We were denied that by GCOM. And we believe that if that recount had taken place, the number of spoiled votes that were out there would have thrown the case towards us. But, you know, that did not happen. And unlike the PNC, when they have lost, we didn't riot, we didn't burn down the city, we accepted the result, and we continued with what is being our parliamentary opposition role. So that, you know, Mr. Granger is saying that, um, you know, they're looking for evidence now. Well, they've spent $200 million, haven't they, on looking for the evidence of the corruption. 
They haven't found it yet. They brought some charges, some have been dismissed. But we've got a dossier that's huge on their corruption, I can tell you that. And there will be after government. We will take these matters to court because we actually do have evidence. We're not talking in the wind, no, we're not blowing in the wind. We have documented evidence in relation to the corruption of minister after minister after minister in this government. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop at all. Would you say, uh, Madam Tishira, that there was no corruption under the administration of the PDP? I would never say that. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any country in the world that has, can say that. We are signatures to the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption, the UN Convention Against Corruption. We submitted our reports from 2006, 2008, um, trend, up to 2014, our last reports. They're on a website in the Organization of American State. Guyana was reviewed by a group of experts every, every round of the OAS. What were they looking at in corruption? Was procedures, processes, laws, framework, to make sure that the structural things are there, the organi organizational things are there, to reduce corruption, and that countries were making progress. Some of the weakest areas in, in our anti-corruption were the courts and the prosecutors. Those were two of the weakest areas in, in, in it. So we brought in different laws, we brought in um, the Integrity Commission, we brought in issues of, we had agreed to do declarations, to, to consider uh, publicly doing our, um, our declarations to the Integrity Commission. Um, there were a whole range of things to do with how you appoint people in the public service, doing meritocracy, and the constitutional bodies being allowed to do their work. The issues of the tender procedures and the um, oversight was critical. We got recognized in the OES, um, what's called the Messesique, for a couple of different things that no other country had done. One was our website. We had the only national tender and procurement board that posted the ads, the minutes, and the awards of the tenders. We were the only uh, country that one could go and read the minutes of the tender board, how they appointed. The, we were also <clears throat> one of the countries in the world that had the Auditor General's uh, reports on the website. So we're trying to move by part, and, and at the same time we're dealing with the access to information, so that if people are better informed, they know what they're looking for. And so all these websites, if you go to them now, a number of them are not functional, they're not up to date under this government. Information is being now, this government operates on a view that the less you know, the better for them. Whereas under us, we were moving more and more to be open and to have access to information. Um, Parliament, the parliamentary reform, uh, created more oversight committees, not only the public accounts committee and so on, so that there, was, there, were, there were measures being put in place and mechanisms being put in place to bring us more into a more modern, um, transparent and accountable nation, you know? So I'm not saying, no, there wasn't any corruption in our time. Even in those days, as a Minister of Home Affairs, I knew police were taking bribes on the road. That's why the other thing, what I thought was interesting, why did Ram Jatan, um remove the, the website, which was called um, I Paid a Bribe Guyana, which was started under Minister Rogi. And that was a useful tool for government. It was started in India, we copied it here. And that gave us an idea so people could be driving along Sheriff Street and said the police stop them on so and so time, so and so date, no names given. And that then the ministers and ministries would look at that and say bribes were taken on Sheriff Street by police ranks or um, when you went to customs or when you went to get a contract. And so the opening up was what we we're trying to do. Mr. Ramjitan has closed that website down. But it was a useful tool for government to keep to try to monitor what's going on. Um, so I wouldn't say that, that there wasn't, just that the, the PNC in particular made it a campaign issue without what now turns out to be hot air, total hot air. 
And so unless they can come up with the goods and they're after spending two hundred million dollars, it is it is show it shows that they 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 lied to the people of our country. They didn't tell them the truth about what they were claiming was being done. Our ministers are human beings. Some are work in different ways, some are better than others, some are more efficient than others. But and that's in every part of the world. The issue is that we are seeing ministers today, after three years of government, building mansions on three lots of houses, um, with three years salary as a minister. They weren't businessmen or so before. And yet Mr. Jagdo's house was the, the photographed and drones and everything, year after year after year. Now, the house that I saw by one of the ministers recently, last night, I was teasing Mr. Jagda, who puts his house to shame. His house likes a little, little house, in comparison to that one. <laughs> well, I say Merry Christmas to that. Uh, but one of the things that this administration has posted about, uh, mm -hmm. said it's the biggest achievement, uh, one of the biggest achievements is the holding of local government. What happened? Mm. Why we never had that total funny? That issue? probably would take an entirely different program, Leonard, because there, again, <laughs> you see, we can get distracted on this right. issue. But they, to try to, to synthesize it, the local government issue got caught up after 97 and the violence of 97 elections, post violence, and the Hoyt Jagdu agreement was to try to address some of the uh, irritants and issues of insecurities on in ethnic insecurities. And so the issue came up about, and then it led, of course, to Hurd's Master and constitutional reform, etc., was part of the constitutional reform process. The, the constitutional reform had to deal with elections in 2001. Therefore, the agreement was the constitutional reform would put the, the, the framework in, but the, the nitty-gritty would be dealt with by a task force, which would then bring legislation in. So that's 2001. 2008, it had still not succeeded. It brought some drafts forward, but they were in constant difficulties and differences. And that is when the cabinet decided, whatever bills you have, Let's table them in Parliament, go to Parliamentary Select Committee and get them done. So we started that, and that's when Mr. Corbyn and Mr. Williams said, um, no, it's got to be a package where all the bills are, are analyzed together and approved together, otherwise no elections. So that was 2008. We also had the agreement for the house-to-house -house registration, the first one. So the whole plan was these bills would come in, house-to-house -house would be done, elections would be held, by the end of 2008, 2009. Well, three of the bills went through Parliament, but two were not finished. The fiscal transfer, which had to do with the guarantees of how much money or the, the mathematical formula of how they would get their subventions. And so Mr. Corbyn advised that they would not, they would boycott the local government elections until these went through. We then tried in Parliament to meet during the recess to complete it, that was rejected. And so we then went into year after year extending. And even when Mr. Ramatar came in as president and with Mr. Granger said we need to look at, at this whole issue, by then the, the bills had gone back to Parliament, the fiscal transfer and so on. And by that time Basil Williams was the chairman of the committee, was in the government. They had a majority in the, in the House, in the committees. And so that was approved, I think, in the one outstanding bill was 2013, I think. And then there was uh, some others that Mr. Bulkan wanted to change all sorts of things. So it wasn't held in 2013, it wasn't held in 2014. So the, the whole issue was there was no intention on our part not to hold it. We had wanted to hold it. The issue was that you had just come through constitutional reform, and here was Mr. Corbyn advising you that, you know, no way, we're not going to support a, a local government elections until all five bills went through the House and they had to go through as a package, which is a rather um, unwieldy thing to do in Parliament. Um, and so that's what happened. Local government is an important contribut contributor to 
to society and, and the development of our nation. However, Mr. Granger has a, a difficult uh, thing to swallow in that 70 local authorities, we won 60%, 62% of those in 2016, 10 months after they had won elections. 2018, we win 65% of 80 local authorities. And yet, those local authorities, in many cases, the ones that we won, are stymied, getting their money late, getting their subventions late, being imposed on with town clerks in many cases who are doing exactly what the REOs are doing at the regional level, holding on to the money and deciding how the money is spent. And their regional chairman who can't get gas for their car to go to meetings. You have, you have certain regions that we control that they haven't had a meeting for months because the regional, a regional executive office is not providing the money for them to come from the different parts of the interior to attend an RDC meeting. So when I saw in Mr. Granger's uh, interview where he talks about s accusing the PEP of civil war by the regional chairman that we won, the regions that we won, not collabor cooperating with Minister uh, of Communities. I believe that Minister Granger has it all wrong in his brain because it is his appointees, his arios, his minister that has been stymieing the work of the regions. It is his. And the civil war, I wouldn't use such a word as civil war, I think we've been sabotaged. You, the, all the regions, I just came out of Region 9, for example. The ministries are spending money in there. there there's no work with the regions. Building a road of $220 million through a swamp. It's disappeared. But $220 million have been spent by the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, another scandal to examine. So that local government, I believe, is, and I'm glad the elections were held, and of course as a PPP, I'm most happy that the elections were held because we won. <laughs> but Mr. Granger's biggest problem is that he doesn't understand how government runs and that inclusivity is an important component. If I were to look at the years of the PEP in government, going from Chedi all the way through to Mr. Ramatar, the hours and hours and hours of each week that was spent with civil society, aspect, civil society stakeholders, regional stakeholders, uh, farmers, workers, and, and so on. Mr. Granger does not comprehend that he came into government sitting on a hair breath and did not recognize, and did not wish to recognize, I believe, that the only way to resolve some of these issues was to work with the parliamentary opposition. We gave advice. We were in parliament. We advised on the re rice industry what not to do. They went ahead. We advised on the sugar industry. They went ahead. Brought the commission of a, um, a commission inquiry on ancestral lands and Amerindian lands. Brought a motion to Parliament, defeated. Do you realize that there's not one motion we brought in Parliament in four years that, that the government ever approved, ever supported, including innocuous ones, not innocuous, but ones that should not create partisanship. It's like, for instance, ones on suicide, ones on sexual violence. Why were those to be defeated? You know, okay, you don't like the one on rice or you don't like the one on the sugar workers. Those may be seen to be too, you know, you're stepping on the government's corns. But why were the ones that were basic social issues, why were those a matter of suicide, which the government itself talks about is a big national problem. You know, so the government came in with an attitude of, of revenge. Everything that was PVP had to be dismantled and thrown out all the, ca the social safety nets, all the youth programs, and they went ahead and, and were firing people left, right, and center. The first casualties was 1,972 community service officers. What, what harm did they do? They were at the grassroots level working with the Armenian village councils, getting $30,000 a month as part-time people. And in doing that, that uh, discriminatory act against a group of people, of one ethnic group, it removed $700 million from the village economy for one year, those villages. Because 30,000 times 2,000 per month times 12, 
is is seven hundred odd million dollars removed. So that this, and it's the same thing they've done with the sugar workers. This whole nonsense about the sugar workers and the sugar industry. And as Jack Lewis says, that, that it's economically, it is economically feasible. It may not be financially viable, but it is, it is economically feasible. You know, in terms of jobs, in terms of livelihood, in terms of drains and irrigation. We're now putting money into drains and irrigation when Kaisuku was paying that bill all these years of over a billion dollars and more to keep the back lands clear so the front lands of this country wouldn't, wouldn't flood. So th there is this, what you call, my mother used to say it, uh, cut your nose to spite your face. Mm -hmm. You know? That's and an old saying. Is it an old saying? <laughs> but it was, it, this is the problem with, with this government. They take no advice, they live in La La Land. I've listened to Mr. Granger talk about um, he's been a good president for Guyana. He's been a lawful president for Guyana. Come off of it. Seriously? What kind of president defies the Constitution for a whole year? What kind of president, from the time he became a president, was, was what do you call it, um, tinkering with the Constitution in a variety of ways? Even the GCOM appointment, which the Caribbean Court of Justice told him was constitutionally flawed. This is a gentleman who, I believe because of his military background, believes that in a very autocratic way, he can run this country. And we had, and Guyana had gone past that. We'd gone past the Burnham era. Granger would have done well in Burnham's era, would have fit in well. He's a misfit in 2019 in Guyana, because in between Burnham and Granger, there's been this nascent emerging democracy. Emerging. We haven't reached there yet, but it's an emerging in which a population has got exposed to rights, freedoms, and beginning to recognize their power as a people. That, yeah, they could change the PUP government, and they can change up new AFC government too. A recognition of people's power. And so I think that the there are people who are dealing with the broken promises of APNU AFC. There are people who have voted APNU AFC, who've said very clearly they did better under the PUPC, even though for some of them they say it's the Indian government. Let's assume, uh, Madam Tashira, that your party and this government, as a result of the March 2nd elections, what is the position uh, or what ministry, let's assume that, it, that you had a choice that you might say that you would like? I, I don't have a, I've been through the ministries. Um, really, I would, the role I played in, in, in the Office of the President as an advisor on governance was one that was interesting because it was monitoring. It was monitoring and advising on how we were doing with our, our treaty obligations, um, the whole role of parliament in terms of executing and, and being the conduit through which uh, laws and, and, and bills and so on that the, the cabinet was taking forward. And it allowed me, because I was allowed to be a member of cabinet, to, to be able to work on the governance issues, which I believe are important in terms of always recognizing that if, you're in, if we're dealing with governments, we're dealing with who's wielding the power and on whose behalf, and to find the balance in that for the PVP is that we're wielding the power on behalf of the people and a variety of people, and how do we meet those needs, and how do we do it in a, in a fair hand, and I think when we're in government, one of the things that, that was very dear to our heart was the issue of righting the injustice done to Amerindian peoples. And so the issue of the Amerindian land, the land rights, health, education, um, all these issues were critical. And you saw by, in the 20 years, that more and more Amerindians were becoming more integrated into society and not being treated as some quixotica 
out in the bush somewhere, which is what they were being treated as. Today, when you go back in, in the interior, life has got back hard again. Things are tough. You know, conditions are hard. The cost of living is high. Fuel is high. Um, and so they, they've lost some of the social safety nets that they had. And it's not just the Armenian people. It's, it's people of low income in our country who are feeling it more, most of all under this government. We haven't even talked about taxes, Leonard. You, are, you are work, and are you, I'm sure you have a family. But the amount of money you now earn and the amount of money you can spend are not necessarily as close as they were before, maybe. And so people's purchasing power has been cut badly. You go into the supermarket, go into the, go into the market, see what people are buying. See how much chicken foot buying again. You know, because I remember that from the 70s and 80s. Plenty chicken foot. Now you're seeing people going into the market, picking up small portions of chicken or beef or whatever, and, and that is what they're buying on a daily basis, a little bit at a time. When the government brought in the 200 taxes, the guy who could have buy a car that was, what, older than eight years, can't do that now. When you could have bought used tires, you can't do that now. So that cut back on the minibus drivers, the ordinary guy who could have a little car he could drive around and do his business in. It affected those people. When you put on licenses and registration on horse carts, on cart men, you increase all the licenses, all the registration fees for basic services. What that did is, yes, the government can, can pump their chest and say $88 billion more have been uh, retrieved from taxation, but it means that out of every household, if they were paying, let's just use a figure of 100000 in tax annually from all the different things they pay, indirect and direct tax, they're paying two and a half times that now. So the purchasing power has dropped. Businesses are complaining. It's Christmas out there. It doesn't feel like Christmas. The businessmen are saying people are buying. And so when a government makes decisions, it's got to look at the ramifications the immediate ramifications and what will be the, the, the continuing ramifications, particularly on the population, on the people. That's what you're there to do. You know, so I, I, this government has been, I think, totally inept, totally incompetent on some basic issues and have refused to take advice. If they don't want to take the PEP advice, they got advice coming from all sorts of opinion makers in Ghana that actually are not vastly divergent from what Guyana is saying, what PVP is saying. But the thing is that they've had an opportunity, I mean, to talk out of school. I was once with Mr. Jagdew meeting Mr. Granger, and Mr. Jagdew used the opportunity, it wasn't on the agenda, to, to share with the president his concerns about the agreement with oil and gas and how much money Ghana was going to be losing from the gas, just the one component to deal with natural gas. And Mr. Jagger, in his typical style, gave the figures and the stats and showed, in, in a matter of seven minutes, we were losing $40 billion a year or whatever. And uh, Mr. Granger, in typical Granger style, because I've seen him do this when he was opposition leader and as president, and he nods very politely, and that's it. There's no dialogue, there's no discourse, there's no analysis, there's nothing. And so how can we move forward when this government, one, believes that it's their entitlement to be there forever, it's their entitlement to go against the Constitution and, and despite the Caribbean Court of Justice, to just keep going, staying in there, spending money like they're heading good since the no-confidence motion, and yet you find that whilst there's there's, there's all this money being spent. People are complaining, small business people are complaining. Public service are complaining, the government owes them money, hasn't paid them six months, four months, they can't get their money. In the regions, the same thing. Small people can't get their money. And yet money is being spent as if it's going out of style. 30,000 acres of land have been given out during the no confidence motion period. 
30,000 acres of our land to a lot of friends and family and notables that support the APNU AFC government. And this is all illegal. What plans, Madam Tashira, uh, you mentioned oil, and that's a big thing that is happening now. In a few days, I'm being told, or uh, maybe in a, few, a matter of weeks, first oil is here, if it's not already here. Uh, what plans, as a decision maker within your party, assuming that you get into government, what plans do you have to give us a better deal? <laughs> well, I think that, that we have already said this, that um, we are not talking about a new contract with Exxon, which was the first, the pioneer. But we are talking and we've said to the government over and over again, you know, auction off. And actually in this period they shouldn't be selling or giving out any new uh, blocks and things like that. They shouldn't be doing that at this point anyway for the last year. Um, and that there are definite contracts that they've signed that would have to be reviewed would have to be reviewed in the interest of Guyana. Um, I believe that there are many things right now we are not totally aware of. We have the contract, we have the agreement. And we would hope that the opportunities will be there in a number of contracts to be able to sit down and to look at where there may be in the contracts where date is expired. So that gives you an open now to, to renew or to amend. But in terms of certain areas of the contract, it will be very difficult to change. Um, but that is something we're going to have to live with. What we have to deal with is what are we going to do with the blocks that are not given out as yet. And to hold on to that for the best prices and the new, new contracts that you want to have. So that, um, because oil is not... Uh, in infinite, it, it, it'll run out, whether it's 20 years or 15 years or 40 years, it's not going to be there all the time. And I don't think we should be giving out uh, all the blocks all over the place. I mean, there's apparently, I heard, um, I saw in the papers that there was a block that has been requested or applied for, and uh, the Department of en Energy hasn't given the approval yet, yet parts and so on are being bought for it. Uh, to put the, the new new rig in or whatever, I, I don't think that this is this is dangerous for our country. The the try when all is said and done with this government and it's out, history will record the APNO AFC PNC government as one that sold our assets out for small change, small change, and it, it will burden us the people and burden the next generation, the next generation. Who could have got so much more? You know, and we, we, wherever there are avenues and opportunities to be able to get a better deal or to, to amend, I'm sure we will do that. But at this point, we're stuck with what we're stuck with. You, early in the program, Madam Teixeira, you made mention of corruption within the Covenant Coalition. Would you say, and you, your party has come out time and again and says there's corruption here, what evidence do you have of that? Okay, the, the evidence is plenty. And I'll just give you an anecdotal one. I started doing research on the new river, new Demara River Harbor Bridge. And I was able to amass documents based on looking for the tender, the tender documents being um, posted, the awards and stuff. And I was able to compile and, tr and create, track what was no contract, no procurement, no tender process, and take it to procurement commission. It was a research that I did, and the procurement commission ruled, as you know, that the cabinet had no right, the minister had no right to take an unsolicited <laughs> tender to cabinet, and cabinet had no right to, to, to approve it. I, of course, went to Soku, nothing has happened, of course. I gave a statement, nothing happened. But then I followed it up this year with another letter to the Procurement Commission showing that despite 
the new river, new that Demerara River Harbor Bridge was supposed to, con what do you call it, consultancy was supposed to cost a hundred and something million. It in fact it cost almost three hundred million, because we're dipping into the money that was at the asphalt plant for the Demerara Harbor Bridge, and we got the documents for that. So we have the documents for this. It shows money being transferred to the ministry to pay the and the and sorry, transport paying the the consultant. Two years after the consultant is supposed to have ended, we have the ones with uh, Mrs. Hughes and, and Mega Video. That whole thing with, that, that uh, again, that is corruption. We have the one with Valerie, um, oh, what's her name? Yearwood, to do with the housing ones. We have now a new one with Annette Ferguson with the housing one. We have all the records of house, house, sorry, land that has been distributed last year, this year. Mining concessions been given to ministers, although the issue of ministers, um, in particular Simona Brooms with, with mining, and it was said that she had no, no contact anymore, we were able to again uh, research and find that that is not so. That is not so. So there are records and documents, and enough for proper investigations, proper prosecutions. Dur Durban Park, if no one believes us and what we're finding, then go to the Auditor General's report. So forget about PVP. Don't worry what, what I'm saying and Jack Day was saying. Go to the Auditor General's report. 2017, $800 million from the Hayes unaccounted for, no documents provided to, from Minister of Indigenous Affairs, provided to the Accountant General. Durban Park, documents still not provided to account for over four, five hundred million dollars, including those, that, including donations made by companies of wood and materials as well as um, contracts. None of that's been provided for the Accountant General, Auditor General, sorry. And you go through that Auditor General's report, 2016, 2017. So my little list and my research and what we've been finding all the time and what Jack Dale, Mr. Jack Dale, exposes, we're just on the tip of the iceberg. Because the Auditor General's report is where the real, real stuff is coming out. When we saw the, the report um, to do with 2017, and saw the 800 million with Hayes. We, we hadn't picked up any of that. We, hadn't, we were looking at other issues, the, the, the non-tendering of the 600 million drugs for the Ministry of Public Health and um, the drug bond, you know that story too, of the uh, Sussex Street bond, you know all those stories. Um, we were looking at those things and suddenly you open the Auditor General's report and there is the Auditor General saying, we can't get any records for $800 million. You, that's an enormous amount of money. Again, on the public health, you go to that chapter, it's again about more, that's the HDML, that's now additional to the um, Ansem Akal one, is the HDML one of another 300 odd million to a company that doesn't produce drugs in the first place. It deals with reagents. Then you have, um, there's so many of them, um, rental, when you go into the rental of houses by each ministry, you're wondering who is entitled to get houses and what is the rental, the costs are expensive. I mean, when we were ministers, we had to, we were offered um, a Chilibar villas in Campbellville, and out of our salaries came $25,000, which was what? We were charged. So we were given a Inside house. Inside the rent. No, well, but let me explain it better. Our housing allowance as ministers was $25,000, right? So if you lived in a government house, you weren't entitled to that housing allowance. So the government took it back. And that was given to um, Ministry of Public Works because they maintain the chill bar. So once you lived in your, in, in your own home, you got housing allowance because you had to maintain it. If you lived in the government quarters, you did not get the $25,000 a month. Um, and if ministers, there weren't enough places available, 
there was a cap on how much you could rent for a minister, and it was the equivalent of about a thousand US, that was it. No more than that. Well, it's gone out the window because not only is it ministers hiring places more than that, it's also permanent secretaries and other staff and advisors who are in that, that, uh, that <laughs> those high levels of rentals. You know, so the, this is a government that almost behaves as if, you know, when they came in, they talked about, are we this time? Is we first time? And it's almost as if that they're behaving as if they're one-term government. You know, so you're gobbling up everything you have in your, in, around you. It's like when someone goes to a, uh, a nice party and they've got all the nice things out on the table and all the expensive drinks, and they, they know they may not get this ever again. So they start to eat and drink, you know, <laughs> until they fall down because they want to make sure they get all of that. They're behaving in this almost scravenous way to, to, to suck up everything in this country for themselves. And it, and it is destructive. And if they, if they believe that the Guyanese people are not seeing this and recognizing this, you know, it, is a, it has become a, an elite that is urban-based, that is upper-middle-class based, that is, has very little concern for the working people, low-income people, and even amongst their own supporters, even among their own supporters. And so I think that, that if, if people believed all the things they were told before 2015 about us being corrupt, we, nothing we did, and I'm saying this as a member of cabinet, nothing we did can compare with what we've seen now. The level of corruption. And you know, Leonard, corruption isn't only about money. It's about the other aspects of corruption, of um, personal benefit, of benefit for your family, all these things, are, and, and conflict of interest. All of these things are part of corruption. And so we know we, we have, these are things we may not have all the proof on, of ministers who are actually taking bribes and kickbacks. Now that we may not have proof on, but you hear it. You hear about people paying bribes for gun licenses, whereas when they took away the gun license, guns from the Amerindian people in the gun amnesty period and told the Amerindian people that they mostly shot guns, that um, they would review them, they would give them some special dispensation, and they get back their guns. Well, every village I've gone to for the last four years, they're still waiting for their guns. They use them for their farms and, their, and the wild animals or whatever. And in a couple of cases, the police have come back and said, yeah, you can have back your weapons, but it's $100,000 that you have to pay. This was not the deal with the minister and nor is it something they can afford. So the, 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 this government is, is also refuses to recognize that, I, I saw Mr. Granger point out that, oh, they took over a mess from the PPP and stuff like that, hard times. Maybe Mr. Granger should have taken over in 92 when we were a bankrupt country. In, in 2015, Ghana was the second country in the hemisphere that had eight years of consecutive growth. We left over 780 odd million US dollars in foreign currency reserves. Our debt was down to what was it, about 43 cents on every dollar we earned. The poverty levels had declined. There, there were more investments coming into Ghana in that latter period, 2008 to 2015 than ever before. And we were being more transformational. Then you had ICT coming in, you had information-based, you had the entertainment areas coming in, so we were more diversified. What have they done? They've spent out half of the foreign currency reserves. They, put, they borrowed from the Bank of Ghana, what is it, we're now in, what is it, $70 billion overdraft. They have um, increased the debt borrowed over 900 million US dollars. So our debt levels and our debt repayments will go up. Um, 
and they've spent $1.3 trillion in four bu budgets. And where, is, where, 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 do we see any legacy projects? Do we see anything transformational happening? There's not, nothing wrong if a government spends $1.3 trillion in four years if it's to do a project that would transform the society, transform a part of the country, open up the country. None of that has happened. And yet health and education has the highest budgets ever in the history. And if I was Mr. Grange, I would tell that, that no other time does health and education, public works and all these places got those kind of money. And he can't say it. I know why he can't say it. Because then the qu logical question is, what will you do with the money? How is it that no part of Guyana can you go to and find that drugs is available? So it's not just out in where I was in the villages in the north of Rupununi or Upper Maz or something like that. It's in Bartica, it's in New Amsterdam, it's in Leonora, it's in Georgetown Hospital. You can't get basic drugs. Why when you're spending the largest amount of money allocated at any one time in the health sector? No other time. Why is it in education that you still have children not being able to have the textbooks and the exercise books. Why? And so they, they have a lot to answer for. He can be very, Mr. Granger is, is fluffing over everything, and that's his style. But because he lives in a bubble somewhere, he's not seeing what is going on in the economy. Took over a country that was bauxite, sugar, rice, fisheries, what am I forgetting? Gold, ICT, tourism, entertainment. What are we now? They've screwed up the rice industry. It's barely surviving. Forestry, barely surviving. Uh, bauxite, trouble. Sugar, dismantled the whole thing without a clue is what they're going to be doing with it. Despite a commission inquiry they paid 50 odd million dollars for, to tell them not to close the, state, the, 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 the estates. That commissioner inquiry said, don't close the estates. It would be catastrophic. Those were the words of the commission. Try to decide $50 million. Sugar, and then on top of that, they borrowed $30 billion from the private banks. Nobody can answer, where is the $30 billion? Where's it gone? And yet when the sugar workers go on strike and say, we haven't had the ones that are still in the system and say, you know, we haven't been paid any salary increase for four and a half years. The government says, oh, it's not us, it's Gaisuko. When he goes to Gaisuko, Gaisuko says, oh, the $30 billion, as Mr. Granger said in the interview, is not to be used to pay salaries. But no one can say, where is the $30 billion? What has it been used for? It was supposed to be used to, what you call, re, re, what do they call it, re-engineer, reboost the remaining estates. 15 billion released by the banks. Where's it gone? And then of course the gold industry, they messed it up. Tributaries, taxes, removal of tax uh, concessions. The one thing in 2014 and 2015, sorry, 2017, 18 was holding up this economy is gold. So by design or by in incompetence, they have moved us from this <coughs> multi-sectoral economy that could withstand with an oil industry and the fickleness of an oil industry, they have now moved us to a monoculture. We're moving towards a monoculture, which means we're going into the traditional Dutch, cur Dutch curse type of thing where the, the country is dependent on one item, and that is oil. And, and, and they've done that unbelievably in four and a half years. I want to ask you, Madam Tashira, and you have uh, painted a picture there of what it is. Why should Guyana in 2020 put their trust and their confidence in the PBB? What has changed for the PBB? When the PBB was in government in the 60s, that was when Guyana moved forward and we were a colony. We became the third. third highest ranking country in this hemisphere. Under the PNC for 28 years, we became the third country at the bottom. Again, under the PPP, 1992 to now. 
Ghana began to move forward. First of all, we had to reconstruct this country because we were in debt up to our neck. I remember as a Minister of Home Affairs, my, my budget for drugs was $222 million in 1992. The budget for health now in drugs is $14 billion. And so we had, we had to, we had a hard time when we first got into government. Things were bad. 61% of the population below the poverty line. And so it was rough. I remember many times um, people saying they want more salary. What do you want more salary? Where are we getting the money from? We, weren't, we had to go through all the HIPIC. We had to, to go through all the rigors and rigors of HIPIC in order to become uh, eligible for loans and grants, thanks to all this. So it's really by 2008 that we really begin to get our neck above water, and that's when Ghana begins to start really moving forward and a, a momentum starts to take place. You see a positivity in the society, a hopefulness in the society. And it is the PVP's track record. People, whether they like us or not, have to recognize, if they're fair-minded, that at least when the PVP has run this country, the country has moved forward. Maybe not as fast as everybody wants, maybe not always in the same direction as everybody wants, but the country moves forward and that people begin to have hope, they begin to invest their time, invest their energies and develop. And so, I mean, the, the, that's our track record. What is our track record in economic performance, in social services, in the improvement in quality of life? Just let me give you one example, one small example. When we took over government, the Armenian population was 5% of Ghana. By 2015, it was 11%. How is a small population almost double, more than double? Because we invested money in health and education and better conditions and quality of life. And so the number of babies who died in Armenian villages in their first year of life was because of gastro and not being vaccinated. The number of Armenians who died from tuberculosis and malaria. Those were the three things we focused on. You're bringing health huts, health centers, training uh, their representatives as community health workers and so on. So we started from the grassroots coming up and, and to make those changes. You don't hear now of you know, uh, large numbers or a significant percentage dying of tuberculosis. You know, because the quality of life change. When, so it is, what is the priority? When I went into the Rupununi River recently, no child has been vaccinated in Rupununi River for the last year of basic vaccines, including BCG, which is an essential vaccine to be given to every baby born in this country within the first six weeks of their life because that protects them from dying from tuberculosis in the first year. And these vaccines are cheap. They're cheap. And they cannot get to the villages. It is as if they're trying to create rocket science. So you now have more vehicles, you have more health people, and the system is totally chaos. Total chaos. And so the, the, this government cannot manage this country. It is too, maybe, you know, to go back to what people say, when you've got bad spirit, you come in with a bad mind, you can't do good. And I'm wondering sometimes if they have been, they have had such mm, vengeance in their hearts, put it that way, against the PVP and everything the PVP stood for, that they actually damaged themselves. They actually hurt their own chances in this country. Our track record is there. People will have to judge our track records. And it is true what you say, Lena. People will say to us, and that is why with the excerpts we did from our manifesto, it was done rather uniquely, different than what we've done before. And that is put up emails so people could email their views in, um, consultation with over 500 people, letters, uh, meetings, and stuff like that. To come up with one of just excerpts, as Mr. Jagger said, when the, it is actually launched, it's a much more technical document now that has the more teeth in it. 
but this is just the where the direction we want to go in. And so, but it was built on the involvement of people, and that is how you create people buying in. That if you come to us and say, Leonard, you know, this is an issue PPP should really take up because, and we say, you know, that's a really good idea. We should, we didn't pay attention to that, and we put it in our manifesto. You have now, you 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 now feel that you have a stake in this, and so we have been working on this for, since the new confidence, talking, trying to fine tune it, trying to to make it clear, trying to make it that it was uh, something that people would would it in people's interest, and so you have it by sector, you have it by gender and stuff like that. So it's a it's a process, and we believe and we've said that. You know, having gone through the experience of APNU AFC, that the broken promises that when you give a manifesto, it's a contract. It's a contract with a social contract, and therefore one has to comply with it. And if you can't, you have to explain why. You have to say, look, we had a flood, you know, and therefore we have to use. You have to. You have to be accountable. After all the years of 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 Burnham and everything else. I don't think people recognize what the whole transition of Guyana has been going through in terms of democracy. You know, you don't you don't create a democratic nation overnight. Constitutional changes, legal changes, attitudinal, structural changes that, that help to build. So that even like first place like United States, which had almost three hundred years of democracy, the reason why a president like Trump, for example, who ha has been <laughs> controversial? <laughs> controversial. Thank you. Um, can't shake the administration. The civil service is entrenched. It's, it's professional civil service. It can't shake the judiciary. The judiciary is entrenched. That's a sign of when you come to a much more advanced democratic country. The UK has the same things, and so where, despite which government, despite who's the president or prime minister. The institutions which guard the democracy, your legislature, your judiciary, your public service, and so on, they, they are the ones that can withstand what may be the fickleness or the controversies of a person such as such a person like Trump or a person like Granger. Over the last 80, 90 minutes, uh, Madam Tishir, you have outlined a picture of a party that has changed, that has evolved, uh, that you as, who have started as a personal secretary to Dr. Jagan, has risen to one, some of the most powerful positions, including advisor and governance to the previous cabinet under that Donna Ramathar. I want to ask you, going forward, assuming that your party gets back into government, would, would we be able to see a Gail Teixeira being very firm on some of those, those ideals, those ideas that you put forward, that there's, there's a new look party, that the changes that you would have been talking about with regards to oil, uh, with regards to a Lena Mina party, are those something that you're promising Guyana, that you commit to Guyana? Well, you're putting words in my mouth, because I didn't talk about a leaner, cleaner party. And I didn't talk about a new party. I talked about the party evolving in, a, in, a, in the context as it emerges. No party should stay the same. But what I've said is the PEP has remained true to its values and principles. And I won't change from that position. I think that in the new world that we're in, the PVP has a lot to offer. The low carbon development strategy, which Mr. Granger threw out and brought in a green strategy, which nobody knows what it is. Have you read it, Leonard? Um, I'm, no. Thank you. Um, and you know, we've had this old thing on the local content, more consultants and consultants, and still can't get that right. Anyway, um, the, the thing is that the PPP, for a party that's going to be 70, has probably, when when the historians write about us, will be a party that has been probably more innovative in, and willing to change and willing to evolve and willing to meet new conditions than any other political party in this country. And, and I think in, in some parts of the Caribbean too. 
that we've done that. And so the my role as a party person, as a, uh, whether I'm in government or not, my colleagues and my comrades know me. And they know uh, my views on a number of things. So that, um, as I say, politicians, you know, you either drop down dead or you're kicked out. <laughs> constitutional reform in closing uh, Madam, So, Madam I will be there until any of those happen. <laughs> uh, in closing, would you be, uh, would you say whether constitutional reform is something that you would want to push heavily if there's a new PPP government? Again, we have talked about this when we did the excerpts of, the, of it. We believe that the model that was used in 2001 in terms of a very broad-based, inclusive approach, both in a parliamentary, parliamentary commission, parliamentary commission on, on constitutional reform, as well as, and therefore the formula we had then, which is not the one that Mr. Nagamoto had in his bill, which never saw the light of day. Um, but we believe in the formula we had then, 10-10, 10 civil society, and of the ten that are the politicians, five opposition, five government, equal. And that to hold consultations across the country and have hearings and so on. We believe that model that we used in 1999 to 2001 was extraordinarily um, effective. Um, there was an earlier model that was used in the 96 period when Bernard de Santos was the chair of the um, parliamentary body on that committee. And they did do hearings around the country, but it didn't have the involvement of the civil society and so on. And that's why the second model is what would need to be done. Um, and people have to look at what, what is it they want. I've not heard the government come forward with one idea of what needs to be changed in the con commission, in the constitution. Mm, there are some, like Anog, who talks about what they'd like to go back to in terms of a bicameral and stuff like that. But this has all to be discussed at the grassroots level and whether people right through the society and then then it will become have its own momentum. And it's not to be rushed, but it's also not to be imposed. Constitutions must, I think, have, go through um, what you call reviews uh, from time to time to see if they are, still make sense and it's still working and whether they need to be amended. And so the very strict parts of the Constitution, which I really like, that says, you know, you can't take away your right unless you get two-thirds. You can add a right with a majority, but you can't take away a right with, unless it's two-thirds. In other cases, you have to go to a referendum and stuff like that. So they're, they're, And I'm not sure, to tell you the truth, Lena, that a number of people talking about constitutional reform have actually fully read our Constitution. I mean, I would like to have been at one point in, in a debate where people who are saying they want constitutional reform to say which, which areas they'd like to have constitutional reform. Sometimes you get the old, the regular hat, which is some guys talking about it. But generally, people have not been expressive in what is it that they want to change. Others say they want to get rid of the executive president, they want a ceremonial president, etc., president, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They want to be like other countries. Those are decisions for the Guyanese people to make. In closing, what do you say to the Guyanese people who are looking forward to, anxiously maybe some of them, to a major second elections? <laughs> well, first of all, they, they, I think all Guyanese um, should be looking forward to the elections on March 2nd, and hopefully nothing will get in the way of holding the March 2nd elections, but that we in the PVP are geared and ready and moving full speed ahead and being prepared for the elections on March 2nd. We believe this is an important juncture in our history as a country to make decisions. And this is where people, the electorate, will have the say. Politicians, after whatever we say and do and rallies and rah, brouhaha and everything else that goes on in the election period, it is the people who will have to make the decision. And therefore, I think the choices that people have to make are two simple ones. One, you know, do you want to stay with a party that has defied the Constitution? 
who has, you know, thumbed their nose at constitutional reform and really has made life more difficult for you? Or do you want to go back to the People's Mercy Party Civic, which has a track record, track record of improving the quality of life of our people and housing and education, health and water? And there's some other things we can fix along the way. But the quality of life was better under the PPP. And that which do you choose? If we choose, if people choose APNO and AFC, and they continue in the way in which they've been going and they're showing no interest in changing whatsoever, because according to the interviews when I read, Mr. Granger thinks that you're all honky-dory. Everything he's doing is right. Everything the PNC, APNO, AFC is doing right. Therefore, you can look forward in the next five years to Guyana continuing to plummet. Every state corporation is in trouble in this country. Every single state corporation is in trouble financially. So five years' time, you've got a choice. Five years' time, what do you want? And I'm saying that March the 2nd, we invite all Guyanese to support the People's Progressive Party Civic, to support F. and Ali as the presidential candidate, and to work with us to put Guyana back on track, and to reverse some of the decisions that have hurt our economy and the quality of life of our people. In closing, then, and I should also say to wish everybody Happy Christmas, that you enjoy the season with your families. Of course, to you, Leonard, and your family, and to the technicians here that have been sitting patiently, that uh, we have a, a wonderful Christmas and a Happy New Year, and May the New Year and March the 2nd bring in uh, a better Guyana, a Guyana that uh, we believe that we can deliver to this country. And if we don't, if for any reason we don't, the people have a right to make a change. And that's also a sign of democracy as well. well I'm glad that you talk about democracy. And so there you have it, Gail Teixeira, one of the top leaders within the People's Progressive Party, which fancies its chances uh, in the March 2nd elections. And uh, we will be bringing back Mr. Shearer uh, in the next couple of weeks as we get down to the real meat of the matter, if you want to put it that way, as we head down to nominations day, as we get down to the real campaign. Uh, we'll be bringing back our leaders and Gail Teixeira would be one of them that we will have in our students here. Uh, uh, next week, uh, please join us same place, same time. I'm your host, Leonard Gildari, and this was The Political Show. Mm -hmm.